Welcome to the Cocktail Guru Podcast. A show about food, drink, and entertainment. With a tight focus on the good life. And all things delicious, luxurious, and fun. I'm Jonathan Pogash, bartender, author, and the host of Cocktails the Grand Tour. And I'm Jeffrey Pogash, wine and spirits professional, author, insatiable collector of culinary ephemera, and so people tell me, an engaging raconteur. And my dad. Well, all right. Uh, here we go. We are episode one. Dad, uh, how did... Uh, yeah. Wow. This is... Uh, congratulations. congratulations, Dad. Um, <laughs> we made it. We, we made, made it through. It. This is a long time coming. Um, very excited for everyone to join us here on the Cocktail Guru podcast, uh, where we will talk about uh, all things related to drinks, food, entertainment, culture. What else, Dad? I said entertainment. <laughs> I, food, I said culture, that. the good, the good luxury, and the. Good I did life. not say those things, and you specialize in in luxury and the good life. Speaking and the good life, yes, yes. Speaking I of did. that, yes. um, I have something in my glass here. <laughs> it's yes, as I do as well. I, I, I made I made a little Bloody Mary um, with uh, Van Gogh vodka, and Dad, um, you know a little, you know a thing or two about Bloody Marys. I do. And I have my Van Gogh Bloody Mary right here in my little hand. And I love Bloody Mary. It's one of my all-time favorite drinks because it's so complex and rich and wonderful. And my recipe is pretty different from sure others. Uh, but it but it's always and, evolving. Bloody Mary recipes are always evolving. So and it, even though even though I may like one of my recipes, it doesn't stay static. I usually yeah. change it in some way the next time. And your this recipe is in your book, Bloody Mary, which I happen to be holding in my hand. For those of you listening, you can't see it, but um, I'm holding it in my hand. And I, I don't um, I don't have a garnish on this because, Dad, you actually don't prefer garnishes on your Bloody Marys. Is that correct? Well, no, it's not that I don't prefer it. I don't think it's necessary to put a garnish on a Bloody Mary, although I do very often if I'm presenting it to friends, I'll put a lime wedge as yeah. a garnish, but nothing more than that. Either not, a lime wedge or a lemon wedge. Not That's like me. a not a shrimp cocktail or a mini hamburger or no um, no no cheeseburgers no on a stick. No, no. Well, um, I, I I I'd like to say that I started off my restaurant and beverage career via the culinary world, um, and I was trained by these so-called bar chefs uh, at the turn of the century, so 2000, 2001. Our guest today, our very first guest of our podcast, is top chef and industry icon, J.J. Johnson. So J.J. and I became fast friends uh, several years back. We've collaborated once or twice over the years. Uh, he is a TV host. He's a James Beard Foundation Award winner. Uh, he is known for his delicious Afro-Asian cuisine. Uh, in 2019, he opened Field Trip, which is a Harlem-based restaurant where rice plays a starring role. Uh, and he just wrapped up his annual stint popping up at the U.S. Open. Uh, please, let's welcome Chef J.J. Johnson. Hey, J.J. Pleasure being with both of you. I wish I had a Bloody Mary. I didn't get the cue. Dude, we'll I'll see. be right over. I'll be right over. Um, the next knock you hear at your door uh, will be me with a Bloody Mary. We'll send you one. Don't worry. I'll listen for my dog because if, if you <laughs> knock, she's going to bark. <laughs> um, well, we, we begin each episode by asking our guests their favorite beverages. Um, more specifically, your stranded on a desert island uh, favorite beverage. So what is your stranded on a desert island favorite drink, JJ? Wow. I mean, yeah. <laughs> right right now I've been drinking a lot of uh, Añejo tequila or Reposado mm -hmm. tequila mm -hmm. just on the rock with an orange peel. Um, and then my uh, chief of staff has went out to dinner like really recently and we had a uh, gin martini like super classic which was also really delicious so i'll be good with either or but i think casamigo casamigos or añejo you know just mm -hmm. reposado tequila yeah uh, with, with maybe if you can slide maybe an orange trees nearby i'll be good wait an orange tree nearby yeah i mean maybe there's an orange tree on the desert somewhere Oh, I see. Oh, you're, uh, yeah. yes, yes. you're still on the desert thing. You're really following through with this desert idea. <laughs> I, I forgot about that. But yeah, that is absolutely correct. Um, interesting. So um, 
<laughs> JJ, uh, you have um, you've had you have an amazing career, and I, I follow you, and so many people follow your career. Um, and you have, I think, if I'm not mistaken, a, a pretty sort of um, uh, standard, not standard, but a, a culinary philosophy that is all of your own and that you have made your own. So uh, can you explain to us a little bit your, your culinary philosophy? Wow. Um, yeah, I've been fortunate over my career, you know, going back 2013, uh, which is about nine, eight years, nine years ago. Started uh, as a chef de cuisine at a place called the Cecil cooking Afro uh, Asian American food or the food of the African diaspora uh, was a, a style of food people weren't very familiar with uh, mainstream media uh, and re- really made a name for myself um, and, and built up from there and then fell in love with rice and then started a rice bowl shop called field trip. Um, listen, there's a lot of rice bowl shops. There's Cava's, there's Chipotle's, there's um, a, a lot of them around that focus on probably like one ingredient or one style of food. Um, but we focus on rice uh, in, in a cultural base uh, where rice is culture and a place that represents the, all the people, right? Where you could come through the doors and be like, oh, I've been there and I want that flavor. Or, oh, that's me and my family. That's great they have it. Let's see who makes it better. Uh, but it's an affordable place. I know we could debate what affordable means in today's, in today's world, mm-hmm. uh, but I believe it's affordable. So, and, um, and, 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 it, and it really represents uh, deliciousness and uh, accessibility. And you believe that rice can bring the world together, do you not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rice mm-hmm. is that one ingredient that we've all grown up on, or if we didn't grow up on it in a pot, we grew up on it because it was a farm near our house. Um, so yes, rice is this universal language that if you don't understand somebody, you can eat their pot of rice, and then you can understand the culture a little bit better. Uh what we just do different is our, our rice at Field Trip isn't bleached or enriched. It's freshly milled directly from the farm. It's an heirloom granddaddy grain, grandma grain of the world, uh, and really trying to bring back this rice-friendly ecosystem that has, uh, has, has become non-existent. And part of your obsession with rice has to do with your background, correct? With your Puerto Rican grandmother, who was a great cook and who served rice, a lot of rice. Yeah, and it, in a sense, yeah, yeah, she was a, yeah. yeah, she served tons of rice. Um, but I mean, mm-hmm. throughout my whole family growing up, there was always rice, right? Uh, in my, in my, on my south, um, on my, on my dad's side of the family, on my, on my grandfather, everybody had rice. Yes, my fondest memories of life were with my grandma's rice. My mom's uh, cook, my mom cooked a lot of rice, right. but that became the era of box rice. Uh, that you know, this was something that you can make really fast if you're a working mom or a working family. So those weren't the best memories of rice for me. Oh, you why did. I say I hated oh, rice as a kid. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like <laughs> <laughs> box rice and me really didn't get along. And and, <laughs> and your background is is just unlikely. Thing. I find. I did some research, and I know that you grew up in the Poconos. Now, more, I can be even more specific. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I happen, I happen to believe that I read <laughs> somewhere or heard you say on a video that you are from Mount Pocono. Yes. I am I from Mount Pocono. Mount, yeah, yeah. I know, you know those parts. I have roamed world. around I Mount you know Pocono place, but yes. quite, a, quite a bit. So I know it well. Yeah, I'm from a, I'm from a small town in... A, uh, Toby I, I know I Toby Hanna. Hanna. I know because it. people would yeah. never know. I know Toby it very Hanna. well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my my dad is a is a is a world traveler, and he uh you know he does spend a fair yes, amount I of time do. in in Pennsylvania. <laughs> only well, I hope only. You've got great, great experiences actually there. in in so. Mount Pocono. There's a great <laughs> Amish market, and I go there to pick out some of the wonderful fresh vegetables and fruits and breads from the Amish. So, did that ha- did that have any influence on your cuisine? <laughs> You've been there. Were, uh, were you influenced by the Amish? That's a very interesting question. I think to to anybody. Yeah, were you? Were you? <laughs> you know, in the in the era of the the time that I grew up in Pennsylvania in the Poconos, 
you know, I used to go out to eat a lot. You know, my, my family really cultivated me to become a chef looking back in time. I said I wanted to be a chef. I know me and my mom uh, had a lot of back and forth on what I should be and what I shouldn't be, which most parents do with their children, challenging mm. them. Um, but, you know, my my, my, aunt, my uncle, Uncle Donald, at least used to take me out to eat a lot in Pennsylvania, just where we were from. And in that, in that time in the 90s, early 90s, late 90s, there, there was a lot of great restaurants in the Poconos because people, a lot of people were coming there to ski, a lot of B&Bs, a lot of French restaurants in the mountains um, that might be open only be open six months out of the year. Uh, so the, it, it, there was some type of culinary scene there. And then over a course of time, it became very like rural America. Fast food chains started to come in and dominate the space in these smaller mom and pop places became non-existent. Mm -hmm. No, I worked sure. at a great place called sure. Skytop Lodge uh, in Skytop, Pennsylvania, which is a phenomenal hotel. Um, I used to run from one shift to the next shift through the golf course. I worked at the inn and at the main restaurant. So in the daytime, I worked at the main restaurant. And at nighttime, I worked in the inn and I would run through the golf course mm -hmm. to get there quick enough. You weren't supposed to do that, oh. but I refused <laughs> to kind of like <laughs> – walk all the way around and take me 25 minutes when I could just jet through for a quick five minute, 10 minute run. So yeah, but I mean, and I, and now as I go back to visit my, my folks, um, I'm starting to see this new uh, revitalization or regeneration of the food of, of Pennsylvania, which is made up of like who moves there and who goes there kind of like the, the food that I represent. So now you see a lot of, you still see the Amish, uh, but you do see a lot of Caribbean influenced restaurants now, um, some Thai and Vietnamese. So, you know, you see this diversity of food starting to come through and then these bigger hotels coming back, which the Poconos were known for that have these bigger luxurious restaurants attached to them. So maybe one day, you know, they'll give me a call to open up a spot Absolutely. for one of them, hometown hero. That would be, that would be amazing. Hopefully, it would be a, a hotel that has a heart shaped. Well, I, well I've tub. been I've been there too. <laughs> <laughs> I, you probably grew up seeing those commercials, it, right? It was Mount, it's Mount JJ, Airy. Mount, what was and, that? Mount Airy. Mount Airy. I song. I can I know the song by heart. Okay, can you see, can you sing it? Where I went to high school. Mary Lodge, full Mount, Mount Airy Lodge is your love. All you of have to everything. bring is your love of everything. <laughs> it's, this is not on the script, Dad. This is this singing is not part of this, but it it just happens. So we'll have to go. With but you, it. you talk about an yes. iconic place, Everybody. right? Everybody, Frank Sinatra Everybody. went there. Michael Jackson. Yeah. You talk about the iconicness. You know. They, you know, people were going, I went to high school right down the street from there. We see these stories, saw it at, saw it at its peak when I was a kid, then saw it collapse, right. And going to default and now back, back again. So, you know, a lot of, I mean, there's, there's all these rumors of all these different people that came through there. Uh, great performances. The food culture was just like luxurious caviar, yeah. a moment of life, you know, martinis, this James Bond feeling of, of a place. Um, I don't, I don't know. I only can go by what we read about or what people that have been there can say. Well, something else going from Pennsylvania to some other part of the world. I wanted to ask you about your trip to a very important place. I think in your life, it might've been a watershed moment for you when you first went to Ghana to learn about the cuisine there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, going was, to going to Ghana was, in a crowd was was a boom moment for me. Yeah. Uh, I didn't go there actually. I didn't go there to learn anything. I was very ignorant as a person. I went there to cook American themed dinners and mm -hmm. um, and try to you know and just did that like this very one minded uh, mind and. You know, I made a decision. Should I go work for the Tao Group? I had a job offer to work at with the Tao Group with Laurent, who was opening a steakhouse, or to go to Ghana. Like these two yellow brick roads in my life. You know, wow. they talk about where are you gonna where are you gonna go? And again, told my parents, oh, I'm gonna go to Ghana, and they were like, What? What are you talking about? What was going on? Like, go take this job. It's a great job. It's like, ah, uh, nah. I actually have a good job. They're gonna give me 
like six weeks off and I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go try this out. And I got all this PTO working at Morgan Stanley at the time, executive dining room, Zach Freeman gave me all this time off. So I, when I rocked out, but what would, would, would happen magically, the way food talked to me there, I started to find myself and realize who I was as a person. And then I came back with these marching orders. And, and when, when was that? What, what year was that? That was 2011, so 10 years ago. Mm. Wow. You know, 10 wow. years ago, super young kid, uh, never, never, never ran a kitchen, never was a helm. I was an executive sous chef at the time. Uh, but you talk about food connecting people, you know, there was one thing there that just connected us was always food. You know, first time I ate peri peri prawns, my mouth was on fire, the kitchen's laughing at me. <laughs> um, you know, there was always this connection of food going to the, to see fishmongers and out to the marketplaces. Um, so yeah, definitely came back with this, this, this ancestral moment of like, okay, what, this is what I should do. And still at that time, I went with Alexander Smalls. I didn't have the job to be the chef at the Cecil yet. Right. We mm -hmm. went to Ghana and I would be cooking in Alexander's house, uh, like auditioning for like Broadway with him to try to get this job. Uh, and they even hired the chef at Minton's at that time before they even hired me. And I had this great uh, rapport with, with Alexander, but you just never know, right? You can't, you can't um, take things for granted. You just gotta keep chopping at, chopping at the block uh, and hopefully it works out for the best, best of your ability. Yeah, and then the two of you collaborated on a book, From Harlem to Heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, um, we collaborated on a book between Harlem and Heaven. Which came out um, in 2019, I believe. Yeah, two, 2018. Or 18 2018. and won the James Brown wow, Beard Book Award in 2019. Yeah, wow. It's been out three years. Wow. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wrote the book, put tons of effort into it. Wanted, uh, I really wanted that book to, to be something that would be on the shelf for a lifetime, like um, Aqua V or mm -hmm. French laundry, right? These things that are like the pinnacle points of, uh, of food, right? Uh, when you go back and think about, you know, Scandinavian food, you think of Aqua V, Marcus Sam, and then go back, exactly. think of like high-end French food, think about Thomas. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I wanted it to be there. We, we poured a bunch in. We have Veronica Chambers, which was a co-writer as well, who's, who's brilliant. And uh, I won a James Beard Award for that, which is actually harder to win than in the uh, in like the chef category because you can keep getting re well not not in every chef category on the James Beard Awards but in that in that category um, you get one shot and that's it. Yes, and congratulations on that. I, I happen to know well, person you. personally how difficult that is. So, and and so what those. Do you mean what do you mean yeah. personally? Well, I mean that I was involved with the James Beard Foundation for a number of years. Oh, and, what were you uh, doing over there? Well, did a few different things. <laughs> but you I, are I the did, man of luxury, right? I, I did have experience with with books while I was oh, there. Oh, that's nice. Yes. Good, good, good. Yes. And um, JJ, so 2018, you did the book. 2019 um, was also a big year for you, right? Yeah, what else? So what did I do in 2019? Well, well, I opened up Future. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what else? What else, JJ? Yeah, a little re a little restaurant that started as a started as a pop up, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, I uh, opened up Field Trip in 2019. Yeah, 2019, right now and, Field Trip 2019. And, and you had a television show. Just East with I, Chef JJ. Just East season, season one, yeah, 2019. Yeah, we're on season four now. Just taped season four. Finished wrapping. Uh, on on Friday of that, well, so congratulations, uh, that's great. Thank you, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of things that happened in 2019. <laughs> I had kids. There's probably uh, there's a lot of things. Gee, you know, I, that's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. It's and, that, that's huge. I mean, so um, field trip, man. Like you know, um, Harlem. How did you how did you choose the location? You know, I think when you first open a, a restaurant location, you're thinking like, okay, who's going to walk through the door? It, like, 
can I get a couple people to walk through the door a day? You know, and I knew my family lived in Harlem, so I know they would walk through the door. And I knew that I wouldn't be who I am without the support of Harlem for my time when I was at the Cecil. So some of them, some of those folks who walked through the door. Um, and I took a big risk because that corridor is like one of the highest unemployment corridors in New York mm-hmm. City. Um, not the, at one point, not the most safest area of Harlem. Uh, but I was like, hey, listen, if I really want to do this for you, buy you better food, it's got to be here. And uh, and we'll become like a true anchor. Um, and that's, that's kind of just what occurred. Um, landlord was really good, wanted us in the space. I'm a big component of like, my dad run, run, runs a, non, a nonprofit basketball program, AAU basketball program. He always would tell young kids that were getting recruited to play sports. It's who, how you get recruited, how you play. So this landlord was constantly honest, like, okay, if something ever happens, I think this landlord will have our back. They're not going to kick us onto the street. So kind of picked a good, picked a, a space and uh, kind of ran with it. And as you open up a restaurant or any business, as you're in it, then you start thinking, you're like, oh, I, maybe I should have went on that side of the street <laughs> or maybe my facade should look like this, right? Mm-hmm. Because you really don't know your business until at least the six month mark. Um, and I think a lot of us that open up restaurants are like, oh yeah, three months, we're good. But it, you know, I've been telling people like you, when you raise money for restaurants, you should think of like, like a tech company you should raise enough money to be open for a year so that you can really get to know your business because it might morph or change or do different things, a customer, the price point, all these things might happen. And then you might run out of money and then that's it. That's a great tip. In, um, raise enough money to survive for a year, um, which I, I think a, a lot of people wanting to start restaurants and bars, they, they're thinking short term, you know, they're thinking, okay, what's my startup cost, right? But really startup for a restaurant is a year or more. <laughs> yeah, you think about it, you put down first and last, like a lot of people don't think about, it. oh yeah, I raised a million bucks. Okay, you put first month, last month in security, depending on where you are. If you're, let's just say you're downtown, that's 150,000. Easy. Yeah. Right? So all right, now you got 900,000, $850,000 in the bank, right? Then you chop, you start chopping away at that. You you wind up with maybe a hundred thousand in the bank, right? And and okay, so you you got three months of two months of rent. Really, that's all you got. Mm-hmm. But that's where people kind of like I think they don't think about that, um, and why we see this really like gang bust of um, of like ghost kitchens, right? Because their rate they're looked at as a tech as technology base. So they're raising on the tech. They're not raising on the food. Why you hear them raising so much money? By the time they get in their groove, they'll be in year three or four. And then start to maybe get to break even. Right. And um, so the the TV show, JJ, how did, how did that come about? How did Just Eats with Chef JJ come about? You know, the production company contacted me. Uh, and say, you know, I know Rochelle Brown and Sonia Armstrong, Armstrong, Armstead for a while. Um, we did some stuff together and then they said, Hey, we got this, uh, TV one doing a new network called Cleo TV. Your name came up. We told him we knew you, you know, another production company. Actually, I look back, actually reached out to me as well. I never told me what it was about, but they wanted to put me into the, to the mix. But of course they wanted me to do like a cook and stir show and they had this great idea and we shot a pilot, maybe like they were going to present on a Wednesday. We shot a pilot on a Thursday, like a week before and Rochelle and her team, like put it all together, went there and it got picked up. And for me, season one, I know a lot of people love season one, but I was not like really happy with my performance on season one. Um, but huh, listen, it's a new that's show. That's really interesting. You're, 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 you're hard on yourself. What is it? What is it about it that you didn't that you know you didn't like? I just thought the food could have been showcased better. The way I described things, the way I talked to the guests that came on. But hey, it did well. 
and they loved it. They brought back for season two. But when I went back to production company, I went back to Rochelle and them powerhouse productions. I said, Hey, do you think we can get a better kitchen set up? Like, like some real like food network shit. And they were like, well, if you get that, it's going to cost you a lot of money. You might have to take a cut on the talent side. And I said, all right, let me know. We'll, fi- we'll figure it out. Right. Because for me, it's about really showing the best product and we were able to find this really great kitchen, good price. And we've been, we've been able to rock out ever since from there. And I think the show gets better and better each year. Uh, I call it like kitchen table talk show where a guest comes on. We talk about anything and everything. We cook. And I, I put it up against any other uh, food show. I think one day the show, fingers crossed, will win an Emmy. Uh, and, and that's just my perspective. Well, we'll be pulling for you, JJ. Don't worry. Thank you. We, we vote for you. Also, you were on the Selena Gomez cooking show, right? Oh, Selena and me were homies now. Yes, yes. Yeah. What's what's her deal? What's her deal, JJ? You you guys are tight. Yeah, she's good people's man. She's just like a really sweetheart. Uh, Selena, um, my dog. Uh, Selena's like a real sweetheart. Her, actually, her best friend and, and myself have a mutual friend. Didn't know that. So we like so I pulled up on the show, and. Um, we cook together. And I think uh, Selena says to me all the time that her cooking got better because I taught her how to like really use a knife properly. Uh, she was using like a 12 inch or a 10 inch knife. And I was like, Selena, get a utility knife. Pull it. Come on. You gotta cut your fingers off, girl. Um, but she, she's cool. She really loves to eat. She really loves food. Um, and you're really cooking with her in real time. There's no like somebody, somebody like going to commercial break and then like helping her out. And she used your gumbo recipe on her show, did she not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She used her gumbo yeah. recipe. You know, she's from Texas. Mm-hmm. So I thought that would be really smart. I thought that was something like to connect with her using food as a connection. Sure. Um, and it, it came out really good. And that leads me to another question about what has influenced your career. Have you spent some time in New Orleans or other parts of Louisiana? No, I've never been, actually. Really? Really? Oh, wow. Yeah, no. My, my gumbo is like very uh, West African influenced gumbo, uh, so it's not uh, it's not uh, Louisiana style. Interesting. And, and you know, I, I heard um, I think it was a short clip of a, another podcast that you're on. Heaven forbid you're on other podcasts, JJGs. Um, but <laughs> uh, I, I think I think it was um, something very recently where you were talking about how you got your U S open, uh, gig. And it sounds to me like, you know, you just used good old fashioned hustle. Yeah. I mean, hustle, like, listen, you can't, you can't stop hustling, uh, because you think you're in a good spot. Like you have to keep pushing and it's about who, you know, what you know, and if you're going to knock down some doors to get there. So, uh, U S open has been really good to me and I'm very thank thankful. So, and, and it's, and it's interesting because I, I think that, you know, the, the forces being joined with, you know, entertainment and food joining forces and how it influences culinary culture. Um, you know, we're, we're bringing with drinks also and, and food, you know, we're bringing it to the masses and, and we're elevating people's palates and we're getting them excited and we're introducing different, forms of food and different forms of um, food and culture, which I think is always the best, really. It's, it's one of the best things in life. <laughs> no, no, I totally agree with you. Food culture is the best thing. There's no way around uh, being, no way around talking about food without talking about culture. Do you have anything up your sleeves coming up? In general? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. In general, what do you have? I mean, what's, what's happening next? What's next for you? I'm always working on some stuff. Uh, working on figuring out how to expand field trip, right. Into Uh-oh. more, market, more markets in the uptown in the uptown space. So hopefully we can get into like Columbia university, Washington Heights and the Bronx. That's the goal for, for us next on field trip. Maybe you might see us in a, in a, in a package, good consumer package market soon. Uh, uh, something that we're looking at uh, on the field trip side. 
Um, and then for me, you know, just just taking it nice and slow. Like I'm, I'm, I, my goal is to be in the restaurant industry, of what I call like Wolfgang Puck. You know, to be in this for a really long time, uh, and it's a marathon. This is not. This isn't a, you know, one you know one night sensation. Uh, and the goal for me is to have a to be the, always focused on food. Uh, and I'm fortunate to be able to do some TV and some brand partnerships and media stuff. Right. And, and I, I always say without the food, you're, you're just as good as the last dish you put out. So without the food, uh, I, I don't believe you're anything. Right. Because it, it will it will die out really soon. Wow. Well, we we think we think you're absolutely right, and I think that that is a that is a great note to leave everyone on. Um, Chef JJ Johnson, this is amazing. Thank you so much for being our very first podcast guest. Thank you, JJ. Anytime. This is wonderful. Wonderful. Anytime. Heart to heart shaped to heart shaped uh, tubs. Heart shaped tubs in the Poconos. In yeah, in the in Poconos. The Poconos. <laughs> um, awesome. Thanks so much. Take care. That does it for today's show. To learn more about future guests, visit thecocktailguru.com or follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. The Cocktail Guru podcast is produced by First Real Entertainment and distributed by Eats Drinks TV, a service of the Center for Culinary Culture, home of the Cocktail Collection, and is available via Anchor, Spotify, Apple, Google, and wherever fine podcasts can be heard.